Ja, willkommen zurück aus der kurzen Pause. Wir starten mit Panel Nummer drei und wir wechseln jetzt ins International English. Man sehe uns nach, wenn es manchmal vielleicht ein bisschen holpert, aber um, zur Verständigung. Uh, welcome. We will talk about musical meets discourse theater and we are very happy to have here director Jal Ronen and composer Shlomi Chaban, who made the production Slippery Slope at Gorky Theater, almost a musical it's dubbed. And it's one of the hits of the Berlin season and it melts entertainment with uh, discursive topics like Me Too, cancel culture and cultural appropriation. And how entertaining it is, we will just see in the trailer. We'll have a look at the show. So what do you think so far? Oh, yeah. Well, last entrances, we can wait for the video. <laughs> Almost a trailer. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll just introduce the two of them. While we ah, great. <laughs> I'd like to welcome you, sisters and brothers, you patrons of the arts, you music lovers. I do not take for granted having you with me tonight. I never do. Shame on you. Gustav Gundersson, the famous Swedish singer-songwriter who had it all and lost it all. Good evening, Berlin. I'm back. Best advice you've ever got? Girl, don't take no one's advice. Where are you riding from? Somewhere deep in paradise. LOL, I'm in LA. Been here since Tuesday. Just shot a new video, yo, and it's sick, and I'm dying to share it, but I can't share it yet. Ask her anything. Seriously, Ask her anything. I can't. Ask her anything. Yes, it's a very um, fast one and a half hours, this show. And um, you are on a slippery slope as a viewer as well. You're gliding through this almost a musical. And um, it's about Gustav Gunderson. We've seen him, but the guy with the fake blonde hair. He's a singer-songwriter, and he um, falls in love with his protege and the young singer Sky. We've seen her with the animal toys and the dress. Um, and it becomes a Me Too story when he drops her and she um, kind of incends a shitstorm against him. And uh, his wife Clara stands to him, uh, by him, but um, she also has her skeletons in the closet. And in the end, it's clear no one of the characters is the good guy or the bad woman. Um, they all are something in between. Um, we want to start with just the making of the show. Um, Jael, you are a director between Berlin and Tel Aviv. You work at theaters like Thalia Theater Hamburg or at Volkstheater um, Wien. But your artistic home base kind of is Gorky Theater here in Berlin, where you are in-house director. How did this production of Slippery Slope come about? Did you have kind of carte blanche from Gorky? So basically, yes, in, in the last years my agreement with Gorky is that we agree on the slots of time and we have a general topic and then they know the topic would change two weeks before the <laughs> production and then they would we would write something about what it would be and then one month into rehearsals I would say it's actually about something else and we would all be able to understand what the show is about a, a day before the premiere. <laughs> so that's usually how it works, and um, it's obviously very risky and edgy, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. This time it did work. Um, I forgot to mention that Slippery Slope is at the Theater Treffen tonight and tomorrow, 
it's invited as one of the 10 productions selected by the jury. Um, how did the special topic come to you, to the two of you, actually? So soon Shlomi would have to, to tell how, how come that he came up with the topic. Um, for me, it was, I think, especially since um, everything that happened in Gorky last, last April, I, it was obviously something that kept me busy, but I did not think that I wanted or wished to do a production on that. And Maybe we have to mention that there were some allegations against Director Shemi yeah. Langhoff about the abuse of power. And then Shlomi, I said to Shlomi, I have the wish, because we, we, we had first an agreement with Shlomi that we want to do a production together. We want it to be a musical, that this time he's, um, he's really uh, an active part of, of the concept and of the writing of, of the story. Um, and then I said, but um, it would be great to, to kind of like we were lost in, in all kind of topics. And I was like said, let's see if there is some kind of like a, an impulse coming from your direction. And then Shlomi brought a story about a singer who's about to get a, a big prize and the prize is being denied from him be, because of, of allegations. And I was like, no. <laughs> no. I actually didn't know anything about what's going on in, in the Gorky. I still don't. No, I'm, uh, so uh, it was, like I already said, an impulse, because uh, I was thinking about Gustav Gunterschon. That wasn't his name at the time, but this singer, aging singer, that loses uh, relevance and connection to the current world, and being uh, drifted away suddenly, abruptly, one day. Uh, I mean, one day, everything he did was right, and just the other day, everything is wrong. Uh, hence, the first sentence in this show is, Everything I touch turns into shit. He sings it very beautifully. And then he approaches uh, the Lord and says, how come you left me, Father? And he actually, he asks the Lord to believe in him. That's how narcissistic uh, this guy is. So I didn't know anything, and it was like an inner impulse um, uh, about, about uh, losing connection uh, to the right side of things, let's say. And basically, I think we both, then our starting point was to start from our own midlife crisis, <laughs> because, exactly. we are, because we are also, uh, we, we know each other since high schools and fr friends since then, so we also share sometimes the same, you know, m meeting the same points of, uh, of with challenges of, of life. <laughs> um, so, so it started with this, you know, one thing that we could, we could really, we could really share. And then it also started to have this, resonance of more social and political uh, levels to it. Shlomi, I haven't introduced you yet properly. Um, you're a composer, you study classical piano at Royal College in London, and then you switch to pop and rock and record your own albums. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you just thought about, uh, told about this guy, so there's Can a I add something person? about Shlomi? Yeah, absolutely. Because, we, uh, because apparently we don't have any, obviously, any Israelis here tonight, but um, just I want to say in bracket that in Israel Shlomi does not need to be introduced because he's oh, really. Oh, thank you, Yerli. <laughs> because I'm he big in Tel Aviv, as they say. Because yeah. he's <laughs> because he's really uh, yeah he's uh, he's very modest, but he but he is kind of a Israeli rock star. That's how an Israeli rock star looks, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One person down just recognized it, no? We yeah, had yeah, yeah, someone yeah. from the Böll Stiftung talking to you, someone who founded this place, and she said, you are a special guy, you must be an artist. Yeah, so yeah. that was really weird. <laughs> kind of radiates yeah. from you. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a special, was there a special um, episode in the music industry you f refer to? I didn't get that quite. This guy, is it an actual person? And you, or was it just a top topos like? Um, you mean Gustav? Is Gustav, he, he, yeah. No, well, uh, Gustav is inspired by by many persons. One of them is naturally me, as always. When you write something, you know, it's always a reflection of you in some sense. And uh, we did take some references from uh, Israeli uh, cases and international cases, but I think um, it started from a personal place. And like Ali said, then it evolved or. Uh, mm -hmm. Deteriorated to uh, to uh, political and uh, more uh, um, general places. Mm -hmm. So for you, what's um, the importance of kind of connecting to a discourse and doing so in an entertaining manner? I mean, you, we have to talk a bit more about the production, like um, how it's um, how the traction is and how it's evolving. Um, 
on the dramaturgy, maybe. Um, it's kind of a well-made show, isn't it? Uh, usually you're working more in the process and it's more open and improvised and now we have a strong dialogue, it's fixed, uh, there's a script for all the songs as well. So um, how did you work on this connection between, I'm losing the question, I'm afraid, <laughs> between there being a real discursive topic like Me Too, cancel culture, and how do you stage it in a way that people maybe can swallow the bitter mu uh, medicine? So I I don't start with the discourse in the sense that I don't start with, you know, definitely not with, a, how do you call it, like a message uh, page. <laughs> um, but we go with, with the characters and what's happened to them. And then, you know, to see what is the resonance with us, with those characters, like where are those different parts in these characters that uh, speaks those parts in us, and then we can we can, you know, connect to the, um, um, to the inner conflict there. Um, but I think th the discourse is coming through the situation that we throw the, the character into and then they just react like humans would. But we don't, you know, first uh, have the, the discourse and then find the characters for it. And I think maybe the one thing that we did take as a gui guideline is to see if we can create um, a story where all characters at least see themselves in the positions of, of victim, perpetrators, and uh, saviors. Or either they're being pointed by themselves or by others, and they all go through this uh, different part of the triangle. So basically, as a spectator, you're the one who have to decide for them whether they are victims, perpetrators, and, uh, and, or saviors. Um, that's kind of the essence of the show, like everyone goes through, through, through all of these stages, no one is um, good or bad or anything. Um, what's the importance of humor in your work? Um, probably you don't come up with that as well, you don't say I take 30% humor and 30% discourse and add some music. Well, I think uh, I, that's the natural dialogue between Yaeli and me, uh, creatively and personally, we're friends for many, many years, and I think uh, both our technique in life and when we create something is to address pain, or like you said, the, the bitter uh, part of things with humor. That's the, the way we process things as human beings. So it's, it's not a decision, again, it's something we do naturally. I mean, Yaeli never tells me, uh, but make it funny, because that it goes without saying. And if it isn't funny, that's all right too. I mean, we don't feel obliged to be funny, just that's the way we address the absurdity of life, you know, um, so it's kind of our dialect. How do you feel for the characters? You mentioned you kind of went from your starting point. First of point. all, we feel for the characters. <laughs> Can you connect to certain moments with them? or Because, Jal, you just said in an interview with Tagesspiegel, you have kind of an inner patri patriarch who's sometimes reacting to situations. Uh, always, always all the characters are a reflection of myself somehow. Or, you know, and it can be also the parts of myself that I don't like, the part of myself I don't want other people to know about, so I put them in characters, the part of myself that I'm afraid that they exist there. But, um, but for me, this is the great healing gift of theater, <laughs> is the, the ability to also connect into those contradictive and, and dark parts and unlovable parts and, and find yourself... Uh, with the with those characters that you can criticize a lot because it's a, it can be part of yourself you don't like. So it's about complexity, basically, I guess. Everything <laughs> is about <laughs> complexity. <laughs> um, how did you collaborate? You have already worked together on another show, Yes But No, or yeah. for, at Gorky as well? Yeah, so yeah. I mean, uh, we, we like Yali said, at the, the beginning of things, uh, Yali likes to keep it, keep it edgy and uh, until the, the last moment, but when you do a musical, or even almost a musical, you have to, to finish a song. Um, so we started, I was in Tel Aviv, Yali was here, starting uh, sending things to each other after we decided about the basic storyline, who of course changed many times since then. And, um, but finally I just came here and it was really, really fast. I mean, I write really, really slowly. I, I release an album once in seven years. I'm really, really slow. And with Yaeli, you just don't have this choice. I mean, you meet at the morning, you say, this is the song, 
and afternoon you, you stage it. And sometimes you work three days on a song, you think this is going to be the main song of the show, and it says, listen, it's like, it's not going to happen. No, but listen, it's really important. Important is not important. This, the song goes to the trash can. So it was really, really interesting for me uh, to, to understand that I can write fast. And needless to say, I write in Hebrew um, all my life. Um, English is not my native uh, language, and I had to write songs in a language I don't really command. Um, so it was um, a lot of discoveries about what, what one can do and uh, things he can't do. And I can tell you that since then, I haven't used this uh, new technique at all. I still write really slowly <laughs> and uh, in Hebrew. Uh, but, but it was uh, um, a very, very, um, how can I say, um, almost um, a, um, weird uh, uh, experience of writing something in the morning, uh, singing it to a, a surprised actor in the afternoon, the day after you see it on stage. It's, all, it's, it's like magic, black magic. Magic of theater, I guess. Uh, Jal, what was your part in creating the show? Um, so, first of all, always, I think the main part I have with creating the show is collecting really great people to work with. <laughs> and I think also in, in that show, that really proved itself, just to have the right uh, combination of people. Um, and I think... Like, if I really have to be very accurate it in what is really my, the thing that I'm doing is to, to really be able to keep an overview in navigating this ship. So, for example, really with saying, with understanding what would be relevant and what would not be relevant, and to understand where, where we need to put our, our energy and, and our focus with, with, keeping the, with keeping the story. But... And uh, I would say, and then creating the uh, optimal conditions for everybody to be as creative as they can, so they produce that fast. <laughs> <laughs> so as we said before, Slippery Slope is more of a scripted show, more than the process of, of like Roma Armee, where you always... I mean, all my shows eventually are always scripted. There's no improvs on stage. Everything is written to the last word, but it's very different because in a lot of my other processes, my focus is on is on the process of work. So for me, sometimes the show is a byproduct from my point of view, because I'm more interested in what would happen to us as a group therapy and as a group's discovery in the in the uh, rehearsal process. And out of that, we are also doing a show, <laughs> and then people can have an actually uh, a look into what was our working process. And here it was very different. In that sense, I would say it was more like a traditional way of doing theater, that we are, first of all, we're not opening it to a big discovery and discussion with all the actors about, about you know, uh, building their characters or their storylines or, or expressing themselves. So I would say it was, in that sense, was very much led uh, by uh, Shlomi and, and myself. And, and also really with us creating uh, the content and th their coming back to the role which is more of a performative and uh, um, e executional role, I would say, than being um, part of the uh, creating of the content. So since the next panel, our time is up almost, is about authorship, um, how do you yourself stuff define authorship? For you and in this production, because there are two other names, Raya May Knight, she plays the sky in Ita yeah. Reicher. So, first of all, so unlike when it's really like a whole group process, when everybody are involved and then sometimes we're signing as Yael and Ensemble, here it was really clear that Raya had a different role than the rest of the uh, ensemble who were not involved in the writing. And Raya, first of all, because she was the only native speaker in the group, she could also look at some of our material and tell us that, listen, that's not, Eng <laughs> that's not English. <laughs> that's a made up language. Let's try to, uh, uh, to actually write something that, yeah. that is English. Uh, so she definitely had that role in the group. Uh, but also since she worked with, with me a lot and she is a very creative, creative person, there is at least one scene that is based on her improvs. Um, and I think she might have also contributed for some of the for some of the of yeah. the lyrics in in the show, and as for for me and Shlomi would sometimes talk about what needs to happen in the next scene, 
and then try to have a decision whether it should come through a song or through a scene. And then according to that, because Shlomi was not, he's not just a composer, he was also writing all the lyrics of the song, or 99% of them, at least. So he would also be really part of the writing and the dramaturgy of the show. So we would just have to decide in which, what would be the, the better way to deliver uh, the content. Would you like to add something? Well said, no. <laughs> <laughs> So our time's up. Um, I'm sorry, we, we had just finished. Uh, thank fast. you very, very much. Okay. And um, for this insight into your working at Slippery Slope. Thank you. For the people, if there are any tickets left, just look that you can get one for tonight or tomorrow. Thank you, Yael. Thank you, Shlomi. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you.